The mother's setback is an unfathomable tragedy that forever alters the trajectory of her life, the death of her son during childbirth. This heartbreaking event, which should have been a moment of joy and anticipation, instead becomes a harrowing experience of loss and sorrow. The mother finds herself navigating the treacherous path of grief, grappling with emotions that range from shock and disbelief to profound sadness and emptiness. The death of a child during childbirth strikes at the very core of a mother's existence. She had carried this precious life within her for months, dreaming of the future filled with laughter, milestones, and love. But now, all those dreams lie shattered, leaving her in a state of profound despair. The joyous expectations are replaced by an overwhelming sense of loss and an emptiness that seems impossible to fill. The mother is confronted with the cruel reality that life can be unpredictable and unjust. She may question herself, blaming herself for the tragedy, even though it was beyond her control. The weight of guilt and self-doubt adds to the burden she carries, intensifying the pain she already feels. In the aftermath of her son's death, the mother must summon immense strength to endure the grieving process. She finds solace in the support of loved ones, who provide a comforting presence during this dark time. Counseling and therapy offer spaces where she can express her anguish, share her memories, and find ways to honor her son's memory. The mother's setback is not something she will ever completely overcome. The loss of a child is a wound that forever leaves a mark on her soul. However, as time goes on, she learns to live with her grief, finding ways to remember her son and keep his spirit alive. She may channel her pain into advocacy, supporting causes that raise awareness about infant loss or assisting other bereaved parents. Despite the enormity of her setback, the mother's resilience and courage shine through. She finds strength within herself to face each day, carrying her son's memory in her heart and honoring his brief but meaningful existence. Though the pain may never fully dissipate, she begins to find moments of healing, cherishing the love and connection she shared with her son, and finding hope for a future where her son's memory lives on. So, my wonderful viewers, if you're ready to immerse yourself in stories that will touch your soul and open your mind, make sure to hit that subscribe button and turn on the notification bell so you won't miss a single captivating episode. When a woman's kid die, soon after delivery and her husband leaves her, she is heartbroken. Years later, she discovers a sick young boy on Facebook with the same birthmark as her late baby had. Millie Fargo let out one more scream, and the doctor said, Well done, you have a lovely newborn boy. Millie grinned as he held out a pink and purple writhing, shrieking monster. She'd never seen a more lovely infant. She soon found herself snuggling her son, counting his tiny fingers and toes and marveling at his loveliness. She then frowned. What exactly is this? Is he in pain? Is he okay? Her baby's arm had a large bright red mark. The doctor grinned. He's great, he said. It's just a birthmark. Many newborns have them. It's quite natural. Millie gave a shaky grin. That's excellent, she remarked before shutting her eyes. Doctor, I'm feeling weird. The last thing she remembered was the doctor yelling something scary and a nurse grabbing her baby. When she awoke, Millie found herself in a hospital room. There was another lady on the bed next to her, but there was no crib for the kid. Where is my baby? She exclaimed. What happened to my baby? After a few minutes, nurses and physicians swarmed in, worrying over Millie, but no one could answer the question. Where was Millie's baby? Then an elderly doctor entered and sat next to Millie's bed. Millie was holding her baby son when she saw a birthmark on his arm. Millie, he said softly, I need you to be really bold. You've been in a coma for two months, but you're awake now, and we believe you'll recover completely. Sadly, your baby did not survive. But I saw him. Mill said, I had him. He was just well. I'm very sorry, Mill, the doctor apologized. He passed away unexpectedly two weeks after you went into your coma. We did all we could. Millie's heart has been shattered. 
no, she yelled. But of course, it was and Millie, like so many other mourning moms, had to accept her awful loss and her agony. My spouse, she said quietly, where has Stephen gone? The doctor was visibly ashamed. I'm sorry, Millie. Mr. Fargo left you a note. He stood up and went away after handing Millie a sealed envelope. Millie ripped open the envelope with shaky fingers. The letter simply said, Mill, our kid is no longer alive, and so is our marriage. If we are really honest with one another, we will accept that our marriage ended before our kid was born. I was prepared to try again for his sake, but there's no purpose anymore. I divorced you and gave you the home as well as your portion of my money. It should be sufficient to prepare you for life. In a letter, Stephen informed Millie that he was divorcing her. Millie grimaced, but Stephen's rejection paled in comparison to the loss of her child. He was correct. Their marriage had been crumbling for years, and there was now no reason to continue. Millie had suspected Stephen was having an affair for months before their child was born. He was going to start a new life, and Millie had to do the same. She needed to find a new dream to replace her previous one of having a family. Millie had been orphaned at an early age and raised in foster care, and family was what she craved the most. There were so many kids in need that Millie wondered whether she could channel her passion and love into assisting them. She had plenty of money and was a savvy investor. Millie joined a charity that paid for needy children's medical expenses, and three years later, a unique file arrived on her desk. It was a plea from a grandmother asking the group to assist her in covering the expenses of cancer treatment for her three-year-old grandson. Millie was grieved by her son's death. Millie accessed a Facebook account that the lady listed as a contact. There was a picture of the young man, a sweet little child with wide toffee-colored eyes and a mischievous smile. Millie was sitting by a pool with her feet in the water when she observed something weird. The youngster has the same birthmark on his arm as her own child. That's not possible. It can't be, said Millie. She grabbed her phone, contacted the grandmother's mobile number, and made plans to see the lady. Dorothy Levi was a sweet-faced, slim lady in her late fifties with a ring of pain around her lips. She began telling Mill an incredible tale. He's not my biological grandchild, she said. Laura married a widower with a newborn boy, and when they passed, I couldn't let young Daniel go into the foster system, Dorothy moaned. He was the only thing I had. Your daughter and her spouse died, Millie inquired. Their automobile was discovered in the water, she said. This was just six months after Daniel was diagnosed. That happened two years ago. I used up all of my money on his treatments. I believe Stephen was wealthy. But, Stephen, Millie inquired, was your son-in-law's name Stephen? Yes, Dorothy said innocently. He went by the name Stephen Fargo. How did your daughter behave? Millie inquired. Dorothy said, she was a nurse at Mercy Hospital. I was quite proud of her. Millie was taken aback. She understood Stephen and Laura had conspired to steal her baby and replace him with a dead newborn while she was in a coma. She now had to crush this woman's heart. Millie stated gently that Stephen was her ex-husband and that she was certain Daniel was her son. Dorothy consented to a DNA test, the findings of which were shocking. Dorothy realized her daughter had done a heinous deed for the sake of a guy. Millie promptly paid for all of Daniel's medical care and reported Laura Levy and Stephen Fargo to the police. Millie now had full custody of Daniel, according to the DNA test, and she welcomed Dorothy to live with her. You will be Daniel's sole grandma, she stated. Permit us to be your family. When the doctors told Dorothy and the other woman that Daniel was better, they all moved in together and lived happily. But there was still one more surprise. Dorothy got a phone call from her supposedly dead daughter a year after Daniel's final treatment. Laura and Stephen had been arrested. Laura and Stephen had begun drinking about the time Daniel fell sick, and Stephen's money had fast run out. Because the couple owed a lot of money to serious individuals, they staged their own didadath and left the ill kid. 
Laura asked her mother to put up her home as security for their bail now that they were in prison. I'm your only daughter, Mom, Laura begged. Please assist me. Dorothy sighed after listening to Laura. I'm not sure who you are. Daniel's true mother is my only daughter, and she's standing here by my side. 